Let's look at God's word. Let me just kind of bring you back up to where we were the, because the first point today in the message is really the message from last week. Last week we looked at, we've been in Romans 8, if you're new here today, we've been in Romans 8 for I think about 10 weeks now, and last week we looked at one of the most famous verses in Romans 8, Romans 8, 28, and, and remember it, it was, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And we looked at that verse and we talked about the fact that many people have misunderstood that verse through the years, but we gave four qualifications to go with that verse. Uh, here's, the first, here's the first point, by the way, in the sermon today, God causes all things to work together for good. But here are the qualifications we looked at last week as we looked at that verse. Number one, qualification number one, this promise is for Christians only. It says, for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. And so this promise is for Christians. S secondly, the qualification number two is it's a good use of bad things. That verse does not say all things are good. Everything's not good. There's a lot of evil in the world. There's a lot of heartache and hurt in the world. So all things aren't good. The idea is it's a good use of bad things that God can take anything and work it together for good. The third point, the third qualification, we're talking about knowing rather than feeling. We don't feel that all things work together for good. All things don't feel good in life, and God doesn't say all things feel like they're working together for good. But he says, and we know that all things work together for good. And the phrase we looked at that my friend used all the time many years ago is, what you know trumps how you feel. And so we have that qualification. We're talking about knowing rather than feeling. We can know it because God said it, not because we feel like it. And then the fourth qualification was, good must be defined God's way. Good does not mean there's some tragedy in life comes along, some event comes along that's, that we see as a horrible event in our lives. This does not mean that God's going to work some other circumstance in our life to make that circumstance okay. That's not the idea. The idea here is we have to define good God's way. So what is the good that God has committed to in your life and my life? What is that good? Now, remember last week we had the illustration of the cake, if you were here, and we talked about all the ingredients that go in to make the cake, most of them, as I tasted those, I was surprised how bad most of them tasted. The baking soda wasn't good, the flour wasn't good, the salt wasn't, and none of the things by themselves, except maybe the sugar, or maybe the vanilla, most of it wasn't very good. But you mix all those things together and you bake them at the right heat for the right amount of time and it comes out really sweet. And we said, that's what God is doing in our lives, taking all the things of our lives, the sweet things, the difficult things, the horrible things, and God, because he is God, can work them together for good to do something really sweet in our life. And now we come to verse 29 today. And verse 29 explains verse 28. Here's the second point in the sermon today. The good that God works will be completed. This thing that's good that God is doing in the life of every believer, it will be completed. Listen to the next verses. So we have 828, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And then 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. So in those verses, Paul shows us that the good that God is working will be completed. I hope you heard that as I read it. We'll talk about it as we go. But he uses five big theological words. And I got to tell you, they're difficult. They're tough words that he uses here. But he uses them to assure us of our glorious end as his children, to assure us that God is going to do work this good that he says he's going to work. Now, here, here are the words, God foreknew, God predestined, God called, God justified, and God glorified. Now, I'm just going to just deal with this straight on for a second. Those first two words in particular, God foreknew and God predestined, for some of you, for some of you, they didn't bother you at all. For some of you, it created a little bit of tension in how you think. So let me, if, if you know about that tension, let me just address it for just a second. In this sermon today, we are not going to resolve the issue of God's sovereignty as opposed to man's free will. It's not going to happen. In the next 20 minutes or so, I'm not going to resolve that issue for you. It's not going to happen. Here's what I'm asking you to do, because in this room, we have people that think different things about that, different things about God's sovereignty and how, it, and how man's free will works together with all that. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very complex issue, and it's a very deep issue. 
And you may have very strong feelings about it. That's great. But I'm going to ask you not to superimpose your feelings and your thoughts about that over this sermon because this sermon is not about that. This, this sermon is not about the things that bother you. Here's what this sermon is in a very simple way. This sermon is a sermon about the certainty that God will accomplish in your life. If you're a believer today, you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You've opened your heart to him and you've trusted in Jesus. It's the certainty that God is going to bring about this good in your life that he talked about. And that should bring us great joy to know that God is going to do that. Now, if you, if you like to talk about this sovereignty free will issue and debate it and think you've got it all wired, I want you to listen to something. This is just three chapters later in Romans. This is Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? Or who first is given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let me just point this out. It's clear. You cannot search out the unsearchable. You can't do it. You cannot fathom the unfathomable. I can't do it, and you can't do it. You, you think you have this all figured out? You're going to be God's counselor in this issue. Really, you think you have it all figured out. Here's the truth of God's word. The sovereignty of God and election and choosing man is in Scripture, but also in Scripture is the reality that, man, I'm responsible, you're responsible to respond to the truth of God. They're both there. It's difficult to understand, but they're both there. And we so, have, so we have to deal with that tension. As far as this message is concerned, here's what I want you to hear. I'm going to read you a quote from Howard Hendricks. This is what this message is about. If you get this, you will get what God's word says. Here's what Hendricks says. The Bible is not written to satisfy your curiosity, but to make you conform to Christ's image. Read that again. The Bible is not written to satisfy your curiosity, but to make you conform to Christ's image. Not to make you a smarter sinner, but to make you like the Savior. Not to fill your head with a collection of biblical facts, but to transform your life. So Paul doesn't use words like for new and predestined to confuse us. He uses them to comfort us and to say, look what God is doing in your life and look what God is going to finish in your life. God is going to complete this good in your life. That's what he's saying here. What is it? So what is the good that God is doing in your life? We talked about it in Romans 828 and now we see it again. What is the good that God is doing? And it's very simple. Here it is. The good that God is working in your life is that you will be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. God wants you to be conformed to the image of his son and you will be conformed to the image of his son. Now, when we hear that expression conformed to the image of, <laughs> we can so misunderstand it. We can, we can think that means like... Um, in the political world or maybe in the entertainment world that some, that some politician or some actor decides for his own benefit, for his own good, he wants people to have a better public opinion of him, a better opinion of what he's like. And so, and so they try this new public image. They don't, they're not, it's not about changing who they are. It's about changing how people perceive them. I know one actor right now is probably thinking through this in his life a little bit. I won't name him, and if you don't know about it, don't worry about it, but it's kind of irrelevant. But that's not what this is talking about. That's not what this word is that says that he is going to conform us to the image of Christ. This word conform is the word we get our word metamorphosis from. You know what the metamor a metamorphosis is? It's like when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. That, that's what God wants to do. That's what God is doing, in fact, in your life and my life if we've placed our faith in him and received him. He is conforming us to the image of Christ. That is the good that God is doing in your life and my life. And he's already begun it if you're in Christ, but it'll be completed when Christ returns and we're resurrected. But it's a process that's already ongoing. So with that in mind, that's what the message is about. So let's look at these words quickly. I don't want to get bogged down in them because they can get confusing, but let's just listen to them quickly. Here's, here's the first one. It says, for those whom he foreknew, God foreknew. The word in the Greek is prognosko. Pro means before, gnosko means new, like to know to know someone. 
It's not a word that just means you're an acquaintance. It's a word that means if, if it's about two people, that, that one person really knows the other person. In fact, it was a euphemism describing the sexual intimacy between a married couple. That's how much they know. That's how God knew you, how much God knew you before you were ever born. Listen to what Henry Nouwen says. He says, from all eternity, long before you were born and became a part of history, you existed in God's heart. Long before your parents admired you or your friends acknowledged your gifts or your teachers, colleagues, and employers encouraged you, you were already chosen. The eyes of the Lord had seen you as precious, as of infinite beauty, as of eternal value. It is a lifelong struggle to claim that closeness, but it is also a lifelong joy. It means that before you were ever born, God knew you and God loved you and he put his love on you. Charles Spurgeon, the great British preacher, said this. He said, I'm glad God chose me before he saw me because if he waited till he saw me, he might not have wanted me. What this means is, is God gets all the glory for our salvation. But listen, listen to both parts. Don't just listen to half the message. God gets all the glory for our salvation, but man takes all the responsibility when we do not respond to Jesus Christ and the truth of the gospel. So we're responsible second word, it says, he, he who predestined, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. There's that idea of being conformed to his image. God predestined, that word means pre-horizoned or before horizoned or before marked out. It means that because of his love for us, God set a destination on us. And what was that? It was to be with him in glory, to be conformed to the image of Christ. John Stott again helps us here. Listen, listen to what John Stott says. He says, there's a decision involved in the process of becoming a Christian. We all talk about making a decision for Christ, but it's God's decision before it can be ours. Now listen to the next phrase, though. It is not to deny that we decide for Christ and freely. We decide for Christ and freely, but to affirm that we do so because he decided for us. We love him, Scripture says, because he first loved us. So God takes the initiative. And then he says, and these whom he predestined, he also called. God called. You think about scripture, there's a couple of different ways the word called is used in scripture. The first one is God's call goes out to every man. Our our church mission statement is the Great Commission, to, to share the gospel with all nations, to lift up Christ, to preach Christ to everyone. John 3, 16, you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The message of salvation goes out to everyone. It's for all. And so we preach the gospel of Jesus here every week. It's what we're called to do and it's what we do. But also there's the call, like in this verse, that talks about the call when the Holy Spirit pierces our heart and draws us to himself. Like you think about the time when you came to Christ and God burdened your heart and convicted you of sin and drew you to himself and you opened your heart and received him. God calls and that's the picture and so we see you see the tension in all this you see how I'm going back and forth and talking about both sides of this I want you to hear what Jesus says Jesus has two statements that sound very much like all the things I've said so far they're one chapter apart in scripture one's in John chapter 5 one's in John chapter 6 listen to what Jesus says he's talking he's talking to a bunch of Jews who refuse to trust him and here's what he says to them. Jesus, this is John 5, 40. Jesus says, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. See, they've, they've seen him. They've seen the Messiah face to face. And he says, you're unwilling to come to me so you can have life. They're choosing not to come to him. They choose not to receive him, to not to place their faith in him. And he says, you're unwilling. And that's pretty clear. He's putting it on them, right? That they're not doing that. And then in the very next chapter, in John chapter 6, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So which is it? Is it reality that can anyone come to him? Or is it just you can only come to him if he he draws you? And the answer is yes. (laughs) Yes to both. Anyone can come to him, and we all need to come to him, but he draws us to himself. Barnhouse is the one who's credited with saying this, and I I, I think that's probably right. Donald Barnhouse is probably, and this probably correct in saying that, but he says "There's there's a sign on the gates of heaven on the outside. It says, whosoever will may come. And that's true, whosoever will may come. 
And he says, but then you walk into heaven and look back at the sign on the back side. It says chosen from the foundation of the world. That's the picture. And so you hear, you hear the tension there. Spurgeon was asked, how do you reconcile the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man? And Spurgeon said, you don't have to reconcile friends. God is unfathomable. He's unsearchable. But he is God, and I can't put God in my box, and you can't put him in your box. He is God. But we are responsible to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. You hear God's word today? At the end, I'm going to tell you how you can know Christ. You're responsible to respond to that. Here's the next thing, God justified. This word comes from a courtroom. It's a legal word, justification does. It means to declare not guilty. Now, you've probably heard this before, that justified means just as if I'd never sinned. That's kind of right. It's not exactly right. But what, here's what it really means. Here's a definition from one of the theological books I read. It's, it, it justification is an instantaneous legal act of God in which he thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us. It means he wipes away all of our sin and he declares us right with him. God makes us right with God. Yeah. Isn't that great news? He justifies us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What that means is that Jesus took your sin. Every, every one of you in this room, every one of us, my sin, your sin, he took it on himself on the cross. He paid for it with his body, with his blood. He shed his blood as a provision for our sin. And he took our sin so he could give us his righteousness. He makes us right. He justifies us. Now, in these words, I hope, you, I hope you see there's more to what we've talked about than just these words we defined. I hope you see that, that God knows you intimately. He's loved you forever intimately. He knows, you know, people long to be known and loved for who they really are. And maybe you feel like nobody really knows you. I mean, who is it that really knows you? Well, let me tell you, there is one who really knows you. He really knows you and he really loves you. And then secondly, do you see in these verses that God pursues you tenaciously? He loves you and he pursues you tenaciously. And the third thing is, is he's going to love you eternally. And that leads into the very next section in the third point in the message, the best is yet to be for those who love God. Our pastor, Dr. Young, often says the best is yet to be. He writes it in his letter. Sometimes you'll see it in the church bulletin when he writes a letter. The best is yet to be. That's true when you look at these verses. Here's the last phrase. He also glorified. God glorified. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about that we are adopted into God's family and that we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus and so we inherit everything Jesus inherits. It's amazing. We looked at that. You can go back and hear the sermon if you want to do that. But we're heirs of God. But that also means because he suffered, we're also going to suffer. But because he was raised to glory, we also will be raised to glory. And he says, God glorified. Do you notice in this that it, it's in the past tense? Even though we're not glorified until Christ returned and we're given our new resurrected body and we're made like Christ, it doesn't happen until then, but he puts it in the past tense. Why? Because God is at work in this and it is a sure thing. It's going to happen. This is going to happen. Here's, what, here's how Martin Lloyd-Jones says it. Listen, he says, the apostle deliberately uses this aortis or past tense in order to give us this final unshakable assurance. In the mind of God, glorification has already been done. It is as certain as our justification. Glorification is irrevocable. It is absolutely certain. Nothing can cause it to fail for it is the action of God. God is at work in your life. If you're in Christ today and he's making you more like Jesus and eventually you will be conformed to his image when Christ returns and we're given a resurrected body and we're perfect in body and soul. That's what God is doing. Now, God's already at work in us. He should already be changing us. Your life, if you're a believer today, should already be being changed and conformed to the image of Christ. You should be growing in him. But it won't happen until Christ returns totally. But yet it's in the past tense because we're so sure it's going to happen. This is tough for us because we look at this now. Here's the deal. You and I think, we think it linear. We think it chronologically, if you will. That's how we think about life. We see it this way. And so all of this is so confusing and so hard, and we see how difficult life is. But God is not bound by linear thinking. He's not bound by time like this. God is outside of time. He is eternal, and he sees everything and knows everything. Let me illustrate it to you. This illustration certainly isn't original with me. 
It came from Corrie Ten Boom. If you know who Corrie Ten Boom was, she was a wonderful, godly lady. She and her family saved a whole, whole lot of Jews during the Holocaust. But she was caught and she was put into a Nazi prison camp. But when she came out, a godly lady, she spoke all over. And often when she spoke, she would take a blue piece of embroidery, a blue cloth with embroidery on it, and she would hold it up. And she would hold up the wrong side. And a lot of times people would think she was holding up the wrong side. And there's a picture of the cloth on the screen. There's the back side of the cloth. And strings are everywhere, and it was all messed up. And she would hold it up, and, and, and she would start to talk about it. And here's what she would say. She would say, and people would think she was holding up the wrong side accidentally. No, she was doing it on purpose. And she would say, does God always grant us what we ask for in prayers? Not always. Sometimes he says no. That's because God knows what we do not know. Look at this piece of embroidery. The wrong side is chaos. Look at, I mean, you see it, it's chaos. There's string everywhere, there's thread everywhere. You can't really see what it is, you can't make it out. And that's the way our lives feel and look so often to us. And then she would say, but look at the beautiful picture on the other side, the right side, and she would flip it over triumphantly and they would see this, that crown. And you see the difference. Instead of this mess, you see the purpose. You see what's being made. That's the picture of this. And then this, she would say this. Listen carefully to what she would say. She would say, in our lives, we see the wrong side. But listen, then she would say, but God sees his side all the time. See, you and I see this side, but God sees this side all the time. And God is up to something in your life. You've placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You've trusted him. You've received him as your Lord and Savior. And sometimes, even for us, life feels like this, like it's a mess. And what's going on? And what are all these things that are happening? But all the time this is going on, God sees this time, this side. And what's he doing according to our verses? He is doing whatever it takes to make you and to make me more like Jesus, and he's doing it for his glory. That's what God's doing. Now, I said at the very end, I'm going to tell you how you can know Christ, and I'll say it just as simply as I can. Jesus Christ, in his great love for you, came and went to the cross and died in your place. And like the verse I read you earlier, he took your sin upon himself. God took your sin. I I don't know. There's a lot of people here I'm sure I don't know today. A lot of you I know. A lot of you I probably don't know. But I know this about you, that when Jesus went to the cross, he took your sin with him. And he paid for your sin. And he invites you to trust him and what he did on your behalf. And to open your heart to him and believe him. To believe him. And to open your heart, invite him to be your Lord and Savior. Trust him what he's done on your behalf. And you turn away from this world and you turn to him and open your heart to him and he will come and give you life and he will begin to work in your life. All of these things we talked about today, that's God's desire for your life today. I pray you'll open your heart to him. For those of us that know him, I pray that we'll know that God is doing something in our lives. He is conforming us to the image of his son and he will accomplish what he set out to do. That's the good God works for.